Good evening. It's a joy to welcome you to another one of our midweek Bible studies. This evening, we're beginning a new study in the book of Jeremiah. So if you have your Bibles, let me encourage you to open them to the first chapter. Uh, during this quarter, we'll be studying both Jeremiah and the other book that he wrote, the book of Lamentations. When we previously studied the book of Kings, we talked about the history of Israel, including its split into the northern and southern kingdoms of Israel and Judah, respectively, after the death of Solomon in 930 B.C. All 19 kings that ruled over the northern kingdom are described as having done what was evil in the sight of the Lord, and that kingdom would fall to the Assyrians in 722 or 721 B.C. The southern kingdom of Judah, ruled over by the descendants of David, had a handful of kings who stood out for having done what was right in the sight of the Lord, with eight of the 20 kings who ruled from 930 B.C. to 586, having received a positive review of their conduct by the writers of Kings and Chronicles. Jeremiah, the author of both of these books that we'll be studying this quarter, was called to his prophetic ministry in 626 B.C. during the reign of the final good king of Judah, King Josiah, uh, who ruled from 640 to 609 B.C. Josiah died in battle against Egypt, as we read in 2 Kings chapter 23, verses 29 and 30, and he was followed by four wicked kings. Assyria's power was waning when uh, Jeremiah began his ministry, and within another 14 years, Assyria would fall as a kingdom in 612 BC and was succeeded by Babylon as kind of the newest big kid on the block, uh, the latest world power. And Babylon was ruled over, at that time, a king named Nabu-Palosar, and at the time when Jeremiah was called to prophesy in 626, and he would be succeeded by his son Nebuchadnezzar II, in 605 BC. Well, the opening three verses of Jeremiah chapter 1 shed a little bit of light, at least, on the prophet's background and the time frame in which he would serve the Lord. He is described as the son of Hilkiah, of the priests who were in Anathoth in the land of Benjamin. Anathoth was a village some three miles northeast of Jerusalem, and while we read that his father was a priest, evidently Jeremiah didn't follow in his dad's footsteps. There's no record of him being a priest. God had a different plan for his life that's revealed in our focal lesson beginning in verse 4. Jeremiah's prophetic ministry would extend from 612, or 626 B.C. Uh, during Josiah's reign all the way through the last of the four evil kings, Zedekiah, during whose rule the Babylonians conquered Jerusalem and inflicted widespread destruction upon both the temple and the city of Jerusalem. Speaking in first person in verse 4, Jeremiah says, The word of the Lord came to me. There are other Old Testament prophets who employ that identical phrase to describe their own reception of God's call to be the Lord's spokespersons, and including Ezekiel, who uses that phrase a total of 46 times in the book that bears his name. Zechariah, likewise, uses that same phrase in Zechariah chapter 4, verse 8. Now, we're not told how Jeremiah specifically received the message that God had for him. It may have been through an audible voice. It could have been a clear impression in his mind that God was communicating to him. Or, as in the case of many of the other prophets, it might have been through a vision. God always takes the initiative in calling these individuals, these prophets, to share his message with his people. And in a sweeping statement in verse 5, God tells his prophets that he had huge plans for Jeremiah even before he was conceived in his mother's womb. Before his conception, his conception and long before his birth, God had chosen and set Jeremiah apart to be a prophet to the nations. And when we recognize that God has big plans for our lives even before we're born, it ought to motivate us to seek and to follow his, his will for our lives as our top priority. A couple of important words stand out in Jeremiah's description of his call to prophesy. God tells Jeremiah that he has set him apart, separated him for himself, consecrated, dedicated, or hallowed him for his purposes. All of those terms are linked to the notion of something being made holy, set apart for God's purposes. God also tells Jeremiah that he has appointed, ordained, or given him as a prophet to the nations. These terms all speak of a special commissioning by God for a specific task to be carried out. And while the majority of Jeremiah's ministry and messages would center around the city of Jerusalem, it's fair to say that the fact that his writings were preserved in the scriptures served to impact future generations and nations as well as the, the Judah of his day in which he uh, was located. 
Jeremiah's response to God's call on his life reminds us of Moses' list of objections when God speaks to him from the burning bush and tells him that he's going to be the human agent God uses to free his people from slavery in Egypt. Moses had a lot of excuses as, as to why he's not the man for the job. And, and Jeremiah's initial response is similar to Moses. His first argument is identical to one of Moses' excuses, that he doesn't know how to speak well. He claims to lack the fluency in speech that's needed to be God's prophets for the nation. And his second excuse for not being able to be God's prophet is that he's too young. And that maybe he reminds us of Paul's protege, young Timothy, who Paul urges not to let anyone look down on his youthfulness, but to, in, in speech, in conduct, love, faith, and purity, to show himself an example of those who believe. We read that in 1 Timothy 4.12. Apparently, Timothy, like Jeremiah, felt that he was too young to be respected or to be able to speak for God. Jeremiah, in all likelihood, was a young man of maybe just 20 years old when God called him to prophesy. And I suspect there are a lot of young people today who share that same reluctance or hesitation to respond to God's call to ministry. Back several years ago in 2010, when I did the research for our church's history for our uh, celebration of our 150th anniversary, I was encouraged to see that a number of young people had sensed God's calling them into pastoral ministry and took steps to further their education and training in order to respond to God's leadership in their lives. I, I'm sensing that we don't see that happening as much in recent years, and I don't think that God has ceased to call folks to serve him, but rather perhaps we're not emphasizing and extending that call as much as was done in the past. Well, God replies in verses 7 and 8 to Jeremiah's expressed concerns about being too young and basically tells him not to utilize that excuse anymore. God says to him, do not say I am a youth because everywhere I send you, you shall go and all that I command you, you shall speak. Do not be afraid of them, for I am with you to deliver you, declares the Lord. God's response to Jeremiah's excuse about being too young to speak prophetically is basically to tell him, don't focus on your age. He, he tells Jeremiah to remove, remove that excuse from his list of supposed reasons he's not God's man for the job. Jeremiah isn't to worry about his youthfulness and the corresponding lack of experience because God promises he's going to be the one in charge of both his itinerary in terms of where he's to go, as well as the content of his messages. God says he will command Jeremiah and tell him what he's to say to God's people. And that has always been the way God deals with his prophets. A, a study of the various major and minor prophets of the Old Testament reveals that God consistently took the initiative in calling those whom he wanted as his spokesperson. And then he promised to give them the messages he wanted them to deliver to his people, as well as to other nations as well. As a quick reminder, the designation of major and minor prophets has nothing to do with their importance or their status, but only the length of their writings. And the messages that God gave these prophets to deliver was seldom popular, but they faithfully spoke the truths that God had commanded them to say. Having to deliver unpopular messages could reasonably produce fear of being rejected as well as being persecuted by those in power who, who weren't happy with Jeremiah uh, instructing them as he did. And that's why God follows up his command to Jeremiah not to worry about what he's to say or where he's to go by reassuring him in verse 8 that he needn't be afraid of anyone because God the Almighty would be with him to deliver him from those who would seek to do him harm. The command, do not be afraid or fear not, is one of the most oft-repeated commands that God gives to his people in the scriptures. So it's no, it's no surprise to us that Jeremiah hears God tell him that as well. You know, one of my favorite verses, Isaiah 41, 10, became a verse that I memorized and meditated on each night as I, I worked alone at a convenience store on the third shift uh, just a block or two off the Galveston Seawall back during the summer of 73 when I was there as a part of a project with Campus Crusade for Christ. I was robbed at gunpoint twice during that summer, and I can honestly say that uh, I wasn't frightened to the point that I couldn't calmly give the robber the contents of the cash register as I was instructed to do if I were to be robbed. But that verse, Isaiah 41.10, brought me reassurance and strength with its words, do not fear, for I am with you. Do not anxiously look about you, for I am your God. I will strengthen you. Surely I will help you. Surely I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. And I've got to believe that God's words to Jeremiah, that he would be with him to deliver him, likewise brought him great comfort and reassurance as well.
Next, the Lord symbolically confirms to Jeremiah what he has just promised to do for him in terms of giving him the words that he's to speak. He does so, according to verse 9, by stretching out his hand and touching Jeremiah's mouth, saying, Behold, I have put my words in your mouth. A lot of parallel passages come to mind in which God also used symbolism to confirm to other prophets that he was going to use them as well. We remember, I think, of course, the vision of Isaiah in the temple in the year of King Uzziah's death when he saw the Lord high and lifted up and this tremendous holiness of God prompted him to confess his own sins and those of his people saying that he was a man of unclean lips who lived among people of unclean lips. And at that point, God dispatched one of the seraphim with a burning coal taken from the altar and applied it to his lips. And he declared that his iniquity had been taken away and his sins forgiven. Ezekiel, likewise, experienced his own symbolic confirmation of God's calling him into ministry as a prophet. As we read in Ezekiel 2, verse 8 through chapter 3, verse 3, he saw in a vision a hand extended toward him holding a scroll and God instructed him to eat it, which he did. And The Apostle John, likewise, exiled on the Isle of Patmos, had a similar experience to that of Ezekiel. Uh, It's recorded in Revelation chapter 10, verses 8 through 11. God instructed him to go to an angel and to eat a scroll that the angel would give him. And John reports that it tasted sweet like honey initially, but then it later it made his stomach bitter. And John was told, you must prophesy again concerning many peoples and nations and tongues and kings. Well, in verse 10, God goes on to reaffirm the task that he is giving to Jeremiah to be his spokesman, saying, See, I have appointed you this day over the nations and over the kingdoms to pluck up and to break down, to destroy and to overthrow, to build and to plant. Now, it's interesting. These six verbs found in verse uh, 10 form one of those chiasmus structures that we've talked about uh, repeatedly in biblical passages. That's a form of poetry, as as it were, in which the first and the last lines are repeated, the second and the next to last lines are repeated, and then the middle lines basically form, uh, reinforce the same thought as well. And we see that in these six verbs. The bookend verbs, pluck up and plant, both come from the realm of agriculture. The second pair, break down and build, are metaphors that come from the the realm of construction. And the final pair in the middle, the the center part, which is again the heart of the chiasmus and and the the repeated uh, words emphasize the truth in the middle, destroy and overthrow are both military terms pointing to the coming destruction of Jerusalem and Judah for their failure to heed God's words and warnings through his prophets. Now, Jeremiah will go in God's authority to speak to kings, and as a part of his message will be that there is coming destruction and judgment by God for their failure to obey and to honor him. But there will also be messages of hope for a future after God restores his people from their captivity in Babylon when he brings them back into the land and and encourages them to rebuild the city and its temple. Now, Jeremiah isn't alone in being commissioned by God to be his spokesperson. When when, while not everyone is called to be a preacher or a missionary, we are all called to be his witnesses and to share the good news of Christ with others. We've spoken a lot the last couple of weeks about the various versions of the Great Commission that Jesus gave to his disciples as he prepared to ascend back to the right hand of God. And he expects all of us to be faithful in carrying out that task, just as Paul also reminds us in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 20, that we have been called to be God's ambassadors, representing him in this, in this world and urging those who are lost and far from him to repent and to be reconciled to him. To further confirm Jeremiah's call to prophesy, God gives him two visions. The first of those occurs in verses 11 and 12, and it's that of a branch of an almond tree, which Jeremiah correctly sees. God tells him with a play on words that he has seen correctly. The Hebrew word for almond tree is shaked, Whereas the verb, the word, uh, the verb for to watch is shakad. Shaked is shakad. It's a play on words, and, and God basically is reassuring Jeremiah that He is watching over His word to perform and to accomplish it. Now, almond trees were among the very first to blossom in Israel in the springtime, marking spring's arrival. And, and God says that His promise to watch over and accomplish His words is even more certain than the almond trees' blossoms foretelling the coming of spring. The second vision that God granted Jeremiah in verse 13 was that of a boiling pot 
facing away or tipping over out of the north toward the south. And God goes on to explain in verses 14 through 15 that Jerusalem will be overrun by invading armies who will come from the north. Now, while both Assyria and later Babylon lay to the east of Israel, their armies would traverse Mesopotamia and coming down, descend from the north, uh, down entering Israel, basically north of the Sea of Galilee and passing southward through the Valley of Jezreel as they journeyed toward Jerusalem, its capital. And God makes clear in these verses that these foreign kings and their armies will be his agents for bringing judgment upon his people. He speaks of calling or summoning them to come. And the certainty of their victory over Jerusalem and all the cities of Judah is stated uh, when it says that each of them will set up their thrones at the gates of the capital city. And that, of course, is where the city gates is where business and legal matters would be conducted and carried out, indicating that these foreign powers would be ruling over the conquered city of Jerusalem. And we will read of the fulfillment of that prophecy later in Jeremiah chapter 39, verses 1 through 3, where it says, Now, when Jerusalem was captured in the ninth year of the Zedekiah king of Judah, uh, in the tenth month, Nebuchadnezzar king of Babylon and all his armies came to Jerusalem and laid siege to it. In the eleventh year of Zedekiah, in the fourth month, in the ninth day of the month, the city wall was breached. Then all the officials of the kings of Babylon came in and sat down at the middle gate. And again, that imagery of them setting up shop and, and ruling and, and reigning over the city that had been conquered. God leaves no doubt either as to why he is punishing his people in verse 16. He is doing so, he says, because of their wickedness and for them having forsaken him as they pursued the foreign gods of their neighbors and offered sacrifices to these pagan deities as well as worshiping idols they had made with their own hands. God had told them in the Ten Commandments very clearly to have no other gods before him, to worship him alone, and not to worship idols made with human hands, but they had utterly failed to obey him at this point. In verse 17, God instructs Jeremiah to gird up his loins. Uh, we don't use that old expression very often anymore, but it basically means to get ready, to be prepared, to, to brace oneself for what's coming. It was used of a soldier preparing for battle or of a laborer preparing for his work. And that command to get ready is followed by the repetition of the earlier command God gave Jeremiah to speak to his listeners exactly what God is commanding him to say. And in light of his earlier promise to be with Jeremiah and to deliver him in every situation, God now exhorts him not to be dismayed or intimidated by his listeners who will certainly resist his messages and oppose him. God says if he is fearful and cowers before them, God will in turn make him cower before them and in other words, he will tremble and lose face and be publicly humili humiliated before them. But that won't be the outcome if Jeremiah heeds God's promises already made to him and the ones that follow in the concluding two verses of our lesson today, where God tells Jeremiah in verse 18 that he is making him that very day like a fortified city, like an iron pillar and with walls made of bronze. God is strengthening him for his task, and he'll need that strength because he's being called to face the whole land, the, the kings of Judah, its princes, its priests, and the people. He's, he's going to be opposed by both the secular and religious authorities and by the common people as well because his message is not going to be popular, but the Lord will be his strength. It's not going to be a cakewalk for Jeremiah, as verse 19 goes on to say. They, and I take that to mean all the folks who we just mentioned in verse 18, are going to fight against Jeremiah, God tells them. But God promises him that they will not prevail against him nor overcome him. Then God repeats the same reassuring message he told Jeremiah earlier in verse 8, that he's going to be the one who will deliver him. You know, Jesus, in the same way, promised us his unfailing presence. He concluded the Great Commission, you might remember, with these words, And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. He speaks as well through the writer of Hebrews, in Hebrews chapter 13, verse 5, where he says, I will never desert you, nor will I ever forsake you. Come what may in our lives, our Lord will be there for us to strengthen and deliver us by his almighty power. If we simply trust depend upon him. Well, I want to thank you for joining me this evening for our, our first of these lessons in the book of Jeremiah. I, I ask God's blessings on you as you uh, continue to study it in these weeks and months going forward. I invite you to pray with me right now as we wrap up our lesson this evening. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for how 
you never left yourself without a spokesperson and a witness to the truths of your word. And uh, you used Jeremiah in a powerful way. We've seen even in this introductory lesson that your call to him, you say, existed even before he was born. You already had a plan and a purpose for his life. And Lord, help us to recognize you have a plan for us as well. Help us, Lord, to discern your will and to be obedient in carrying that out each day that we live. And we'll give you thanks for that in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, thanks again for joining me this evening. I'm looking forward to seeing you this coming Lord's Day. Blake will be beginning a new series from the book of Proverbs this coming Sunday. I hope you'll join us for that. God bless you. Have a great rest of your week. Bye for now.